My name is Daniel McCaffrey and this is part of a series on the productive economy. The threats to it, its opportunities and of course where it sits within the political and economic system of a small understandable country that keeps good statistics, New Zealand. We come now to the greatest threat to the productive economy is financialization. It's not the financial system, it's the financialization of the finance system. Now, it's complex. It's not simple. And I think in my book I've explained it in terms that can be understood simply. What is it? Financialization. Everyone bangs on about it. Well, the reason I say it's the greatest threat because financialization in the great financial crash of 2008 nearly brought the world's productive economy to a dead stop, still stop. And that's a threat. It's in my book. I'll try and explain it. Videos are, you only cram so many words and images in, but a book, well, you can explain things like that. It describes a development over the last 30 years where the financial sector grew out of all proportion to the productive economy within which it resided. Um, the main function of the financial sector used to be to take the savings off of the productive sector and channel it into things people wanted, like houses, businesses, cars. The banks, you went to the bank, you got a loan for a business, for a house, for a car. That changed. Now, John Kay notes that only 3% of British bank assets are made to loans or entities engaged in the productive production of goods and services. 3%. Oscar Jordan, Alan Dave, Taylor, Mudit Shulmarik, Estimate that around 15% of capital coming from financial institutions today is used to fund business investments, whereas in the 20th century, it was the majority of what the banks did. George Gilder, in his new book, The Scandal of Money, the financial uh, investment sector nearly tripled its share of the US economy and private credit nearly tripled its share of advanced country GDP. This is the growth of a mass collection of financial assets, financialization. The London financial sector used to hold assets amounting to 100% of British GDP. Now it is 400%. At best, 20% of the funds in the financial sector go back to the productive economy, where things are made, where wealth is created, where profit is added, where wages are paid, and where prosperity advances. It was made possible by advances in computer technology and new economic models and theories. Economists come along with a lot of new theories. Um, and Alan Greenspan can take the majority of the blame for some of advancing or holding to some of these theories. The first was the Rational Market Hypothesis, REH. And this held in the 1990s and the early 2000s that the markets were rational. People acted rationally within these markets and they would uh, behave to their best advantage and therefore you didn't need to get too excited about what was going on. The expansion of debt carried little risk because after all rational people in the market would, uh, could be relied on not to do such an irrational thing as cause crash. Now the efficient market hypothesis, EMH, said that the prices you had reflected all the available information that the participants would have. And therefore, of course, people were dealing with the real price of the financial instruments they were dealing with and selling. Well, of course, the value to risk and, and mark-to-market models <laughs> were all overturned in the, in the Great Crash. They didn't work. Now, they didn't describe the real world and had nothing to do with it. One of the better explanations of the intricacies of it is a movie, The Big Short. It's on Netflix, I think, and I thoroughly recommend looking at it. Uh, where a bunch of heretics said that this is all unreal. This is going to go bang. And they were right. Um, Robert Rodriguez had been saying that for ages. Um, and Robert Peston, a uh, knowledgeable uh, economic journalist, uh, had been reporting finance for 20 years was astonished when he visited a London trading floor and realised he had not appreciated what securitisation, that's making into securities, CDOs, CDSs, 
and all the wonderful creations of the early 2000s. And he also understood that the owners of the bank and the boards of the bank had no idea what their trading rooms were up to and what the effect of securitization uh, was causing. Um, it was caused a great deal by the quants, people who were hired with PhDs in mathematics or physics, because they believed they could quantify risk. And a most wonderful article by Alan J. Levinovitz, uh, The New Astrology. Do read it. Real-world history tells a different story of mathematical models masquerading as science, and a public eagle to buy them, mistaking eloquent equations for empirical accuracy. It lacks what, I, what, what has been remarked upon by uh, a, a German philosopher, Scheller, Litungwissen, <laughs> a science in which truth is confirmed by instrumental efficiency. You don't believe anything until it's been proved. And you can only be left with the immortal words of uh, the Prime Minister Jim Hacker in the series Yes Minister. Computer models are no different from fashion models. They're seductive, unreliable, easily corrupted, and they lead sensible people to make fools of themselves. It speaks for itself. At one stage, everyone, and they still do, was calling it a casino. Say, this is a casino of money where people are just gambling with, with other people's money. That's not true. A casino is a highly organized place. There are lots of people running around trying to stop fraud. There are state rules and regulations which are in the main adhered to. And not everybody loses. Not everybody wins. The house is a known expectation of financial return uh, given the odds of all the games. They also masqueraded it as financial engineering. You don't find engineers much in the pub and they're not much abounding in politics. They're far too realistic for the sort of nonsense that was being peddled. It wasn't engineering. Well, there you are when the crash came. It's all very interesting. The worst uh, element of it all was the growth of institutions who were deemed too big to fail. And it still prevails. And had, they had to be rescued by the government. They were too big to fail. I refer you to the wonderful way the United States came out of the 1921 crash or depression. They had a mass liquidation. It was terrible for 18 months. But they recovered and got on with the prosperity of the 20s. It puts them outside the law. It says, you can't touch us. We're too big to fail. Whatever we do, whatever moral hazard we create, you can't touch us. You can't regulate us. We're like beyond the pale, a place where no law prevails, like the United States and the Wild West, west of the Mississippi. We're not territories. We're, you can't do anything to us. And the arrogance that comes with it is simply staggering. So what are the solutions? Well, there are a number of solutions. One is to, uh, instead of relying on debt carried forward uh, by uh, the financial engineers, is to create bonds, infrastructure bonds, to build infrastructure, and not have the state go mad with the people's money building bridges. Issue bonds. The bondholders will be interested in the progress. And they will come out of private savings out of the pool of money created by the productive economy. And I'll stop a bit of chicanery of who's getting the, the, uh, the gifts of regional development funds. The second thing is to divide the banks up, really divide them, like Gaul, to three parts. Commercial banks, they used to be called, you know, the Commercial Bank of Australia. Banks who deal with commerce, with the productive economy, so when people put their money in there, they know the money's not going to Wall Street for a few overnight gambles on the, on the road of the Swiss franc, but it's actually going to be lent back to factories, to farms, to businesses, to enterprises. That's one kind of bank, a commercial bank. The second is real savings banks. 
restrict the savings banks from parking their money overnight, restrict them out of derivatives, restrict them out of securitisation, and have them so that they are savings banks. So as people can save when they want a house or a car or a new washing machine, it will come from the accumulated real savings of real people in the productive economy. And it will be put to the use of real people and the provision of those assets will increase the wealth in the productive economy, the real economy. And as for the rest of the investment banks, well, everyone wants to go around investing in, in uh, all sorts of vastly interesting things. Because of the low interest rates uh, generated by the central banks and the prolific printing of money, everyone wants to buy property. Well, interest rates are low. The rich are paying 2%. The poor with the payday lenders are paying 700%. But that's a different world. And not under any circumstances to guarantee the investment sector by the government. Never, ever, ever to bail out a bank in the investment sector. They want to go investing, they take the risk. The government could stand behind the savings of the people in the savings banks. And it could stand behind the productive economy and the enterprises who rely on loans to carry on their trading and buy stock and keep stuff in warehouses. It could stand behind the commercial banks, the savings banks, but under no circumstances to stand behind those bandits in the investment sector in securitisation. And secondly, the central bank, it was a wonderful idea taking it out of the hands of politicians who cranked up the money supply to win the odd election, and it's worked very successfully. You might want to go back and try and really understand Friedman's theory. That saved New Zealand in the 1980s. I used to always sit at Labour Party meetings all through the early 80s before the Labour Party came to power, and my sole question at every meeting was, what is the rate of M3? We're printing money like crazy. The answer is that the if the Reserve Bank restricts the money supply when inflation has got out of hand, it will control inflation. The corollary, the opposite, as you can see in the world today, is not true. Low interest rates do not generate production in the production economy. They simply generate uh, uh, property booms, asset booms, and uh, the prolific waste of money by the investment sector. Interest rates would be better at 4% says that the retirees and the people who saved money, the good people, would get a return on their, their savings. And not at 1% where they're destroyed, where only the, the borrowers and debtors have a banquet of the vanities and the savers are left out in the cold. So it isn't true that the opposite of high interest rates to curb inflation, that low interest rates will create it. And it's doing terrible and devastating harm to the savers in our society. Well, that's a few notion, but the main principle is do no harm. Do not let the investment sector come clamouring in with state support in many instances, uh, destroying the, um, the, uh, trans the uh, productive economy. A couple of things won't work. Transaction taxes, <laughs> that'll just be fun. There is a social solution. As Deirdre McCloskey pointed out, the productive economy was built on ethos and ethics by good and decent behaviour built up through the 1800s and the 1900s between people in business and dealing with people of integrity who would pay their debts and honour their obligations and uh, where a man's word was his bond. Now, of course, it would be a man and a woman's word be their bond. And some things were not done, simply not done. It was not acceptable social behaviour. And that was a more effective curb than any number of laws and regulations which can be ignored if, if the punishment is not immediately enforceable. There's about $365 trillion of this synthetic, collateralised, securitised money in the system at the moment. It's not good. The legacy of all that has been massive debt. Instead of a liquidation of debt after 2008, it has massively expanded to totally eye-watering proportions. 
government debt. Oh, you don't even want to think about that. Governments are in debt right up to their eyebrows and beyond. Uh, the United States owes $20 trillion. Uh, Italy, where would you start? The United States um, state debt, municipal debt, is, is at six and a half. Uh, Illinois alone owns $6.6 .6 billion and have no notion how to earn it. Even a place where wealthy people live, like Connecticut, and debt up to beyond anywhere. Canada, well, household market debt is at uh, 1.933 trillion Canadian dollars, up 5% over a five year cycle. New Zealand, per capita, debt's 160% of incomes, one of the highest in the world. China, good heaven. So we have created massive debt post the 2008 crisis. We have not addressed the, uh, what I would consider just the most sensible policy of dividing the banks into three separate sections, two of whom will produce prosperity and the third can be driven out into the wilderness if necessary. The states are bit financialization. In New Zealand, if you looked at, and I'm going to go do it, I should have done it already, the amount of trade and derivatives, the amount of synthetic money passing around the place, we're not so bad. We were saved by the Reserve Bank Act of 1989, to some degree. And although a couple of billion dollars was lost on that clan in South Canterbury, um, there's been a bit of caution in the system as to who should be guaranteed uh, salvation if a crash comes. The sad news for New Zealand's productive economy is that the silly uh, Keynesian models of economics and, and the various uh, remedies that have been profuted, 11 thousand pages of the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States has not remedied the situation. There is a possibility of a, an economic crash coming, it always does. It's the cycle of you know enthusiasm, investment and then a bit of a curbing by reality. The idea that the government can smooth them out with some uh, Keynesian injection is pure madness. You take money from the productive economy, you spend it on crazy government schemes that don't work, and the debt is still owed by the productive economy, or if the government raises debt, it's owned by the government and uh, are descendant for generations to come. We can't batten down the hatches by getting a bit of reality into the system. We have not much to reform, but the best, effective, most, most incredibly intelligent thing we can do is to first see that the productive economy comes to no harm and secondly see that we take as much opportunities in, in our virtual reality industries and in our tech industry and in our food industries and in our fishing and in our agricultural industries and in our manufacturing industries to get as smart as we can, as productive as we can and produce the goods and services that we need and the rest of the world needs. And anything that harms that and there are many coming along with this new prolific government. Anything that harms that puts us at risk. A risk if we took to our scrapers and did some work on the matter we need not face.